Welcome to the Division of Education, Innovation and Energy e-learning program. I am Ms. Jamila Aminbakas, CAPE facilitator in the area of biology. Today, we are going to go into sexual reproduction in plants. As you know, you have been conducting classes in both module one and module two in CAPE biology unit one. And most of you would be at the point where you are in module three. Some persons are at different points. And so I have be decided to begin the lesson with sexual reproduction in plants. Later on, we will go on to sexual reproduction in animals. And further, should there be any requests to go back into other areas like genetics or even microbiology, um, where we're looking at the macromolecules, I will be willing to facilitate that. So let's look at the lesson today. Sexual reproduction in plants. Why is sexual reproduction preferred by organisms? We know that organisms can carry out asexual reproduction or sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction is the preferred form of reproduction by organisms since there is more mixing of genes, there's more variation, and that will in confer greater strength to the species. Look at this pit here. I am certain we all can do this mango right now, especially at this stage where we all are home. We will enjoy that. This mango was produced through the process of sexual reproduction. We need to be able to produce plants to be able to continue the species. And sexual reproduction will produce plants that have more virulence, but will be stronger and will be able to withstand different environmental conditions. In today's topic, we are going to look at pollination. You would have done topics before that will put you in good stead to have a clear understanding of this topic. We would have done the dicot flower structure. We would have done a meiosis and mitosis. So what would we like to know at the end of this lesson? We would like to know, we would like to be able to identify the histology of dicot plants and anta and ovary. Histology, we have met this word before. You would have done module one where you looked at structure of stems, structure of leaves, and you would have done tissue plant drawings. So when we were doing tissue plants, we were doing histology. That's the study of tissues. So we would want to be able to know the different tissues that are found in the dicot plant, anther and ovary. We'll also like to be able to discriminate between self and cross-pollination. As we go on, we will explain this. We'd like to be able to uh, explain the morphological features. Again, another big word, it simply means the anatomical features. What is there? What is the anatomy of these structures to facilitate cross-pollination? How does the plant allow cross-pollination to take place? How does it avoid self-pollination from taking place? Next, we'd like to be able to outline the steps involved in the formation of the gamete. Large, with big word here, gametogenesis. How does a plant carry out the formation of the male gamete and the female gamete? Then we'll want to be able to look at the microspore and the megaspore. Additionally, we don't only want to be able to know certain things. We want to be able to do certain things. You are required to know certain skills. You are required to do certain drawings and to be able to label and annotate drawings. So I would like you to be able to, even though you are at home and you're sitting there, I want you to go get your paper, get your drawing paper, get your pencils, because I would like at the end of this lesson for you to be able to draw, 
these structures, we'll be looking at the plant anther and the plant ovary. And we'll be also looking at the pollen grain and an ovule. So at the end of this lesson, I would like that you have a good grasp, a solid understanding of how do we draw these, these um, structures. Lastly, I would like you to have an appreciation of the significance of carrying out cross-pollination. Why cross-pollination as opposed to self-pollination? And I'd also like you to be able to apply your knowledge in answering CXC type questions. We are not just here, students, to cram off work. We are not just here to be able to get everything correct. Yes, we like to have that. But at the end of the day, you have to sit in an exam room. And it's based on how you would have taken in all this knowledge. You have to now apply that knowledge in unknown situations as the exam questions will be applied to you. Okay, so that is what we will be doing during this session. Let's move along. These are some past paper questions that I pulled out from uh, successive years from CXE. They, they are related to the topic at hand. I would like you to use your phone, take a picture of them, and while we are going through the lesson, and when we have breaks between the lesson, I would like you to attempt to answer these questions. At the end of the lessons, we are going to come back to them, and we are going to be able to answer it based on what we would have learned as we went through the lesson. Okay, so I'm giving you 15 seconds. You should have gone for your phone by now. Take a picture of it, and we can move on. We have to get accustomed to this new method of teaching and learning because as it is, we have no choice, right? So please, I know it's different, but just try to flow with it and try to see how you could un understand what's happening. Later on, as we go through this exercise, the education division will be putting in place a program to have facilitators work with you. So any questions that may arise in this exercise, even though you may not be able to directly speak to me, you will be able to have facilitators work with you to get greater clarity on all the different subject areas that we have put forward. So I was giving you time to get this together. This is the basic flower structure. We have all been doing this for years. Since primary school, you have been looking at the structure of the flower. But I want you to key into two main parts. We have the male part of the flower, and we have the female part of the flower. Because pollination, as we would see, involves these two parts. Let's take a look at these two parts a little closer. So the male part of the flower is called the stamen. S-T-A-M-E-N, the stamen. And the stamen is made up of two parts. The anther, which is the part that actually produces the pollen grain, and the filament. So you have the anther and the filament. The filament, although it seems like it's just sitting there, has a very important role to play. Because the filament actually projects the anther upwards and outwards so that it can meet with other um, agents who will help to pollinate the flower. So for example, a bee that may be passing by would quickly brush on the anther. And so the pollen grains that are there can then be picked up by the legs of the bees and so on. So this structure, the filament, because the filament is there, the structure here, because the filament is there, it can actually stick the anther out. So it plays a very, very important role. Because if this was not there, then the anther will be very close, and so it will not get in touch with the pollinators. The collection of the stamen, because sometimes a flower, as you can see here, may have several stamen. The collection of stamen is known as the androsium. Let me write that word for you. Androsium. 
A N D R O C I U M. Androsium. So you hear the word andro? Male, right? So that's the collection of the male parts of a flower. Let's look at the female parts of the flower now. The female part of a flower is known as the carpel, C A R P E L, or the pistil, P I S T I L. And this is made up of three main parts the stigma, the stigma, which is this part that is at the very top, and that is the part that the pollen grains would land on. We also have the style, and this is the tube that actually is responsible for carrying the pollen grain nucleus downwards. And it plays a very important role again, because if this was not here, the stigma will not get into the environment as close as possible to the, either the wind or the insects to be able to pick up the pollen grains. You also have the ovary, this part down here. Let me get a different color so that you can see it a little clearer. The ovary, this part down there, that is the part in which fertilization takes place. That is the part that eventually will form the seeds. And that is the part that eventually will form the fruit. So the mango that we saw earlier, this here is where the mango came from. Good? The rest of it is just to facilitate the, what is happening inside of the ovary. So let's go again. The main parts of the female part of the flower will be the stigma. Agreed? The style and the ovary. And within the ovary, you have the ovule. Good? Let's go again. Stigma, style, ovary. I know you may say, Miss, I know that already. I know that a long time. Good. I just want to reinforce and make sure you have it. Because when we go into the process of the formation of the ovule and so on, you need to have a sound appreciation of these parts. The collection of these three parts, as we said, is known as the carpel. But a flower may have more than one carpel. And so the collection of carpel is known as gynecium, G-Y-N-E-C-I-U-M. OK, the gynecium. Again, gyne, female reproductive structure, gyne, gynecium, right? So the androsium and the gynecium. At Cape level, it's not really required that you know these terms. But you may see it in passing, so I want you to have an appreciation of it. Okay? The rest of the flower is simply there to facilitate pollination. Very good. How are you all going? Good. Let's continue. Remember what the objectives are. Good. Take a look at the objectives because at the end, we want to be able to achieve those obje objectives. Pollination. One of the objectives was for you to be able to differentiate between self-pollination and cross-pollination. What then is pollination? I can hear you answering. Miss, I know that. Pollination is the transfer of pollen grains from the anther to the stigma. And may I add, of a plant of the same species. Because if it's not of the same species, then you will not have the germination of the pollen grains. So pollination, whether it is self or cross, involves the transfer of pollen grains from the anther to the stigma of a plant of the same species. From the anther to the stigma. That's pollination. Self and cross-pollination. Again, very importantly, and you will see it. Let me just go ahead and show you something. Self and cross-pollination. As you can see here, we have two plants. How do we know it's two plants? Why not four plants? We are looking at where the stem and the root structure is. So even though it seems like it's branching out, it's really two plants. And we are seeing here you have two flowers. In A, 
we are seeing where the pollen grain, which would be in the structure called the anther, will move from the, from the anther onto the stigma of the same flower. Now that is pollination, but it is self-pollination. It is self-pollination. It is going to bring some variation. Self-pollination does bring variation because remember, each pollen grain is unique. It was formed from the process of meiosis. So it is unique. But because they came from the same plant, you will still have a lot in common. A lot of the genetic makeup will be similar. Good? So this is pollination. It is self. But look at B. You are moving from the anther onto the stigma of another flower. Isn't that cross-pollination, miss? I've heard people would have identified that as cross-pollination in the past. No, because it is found on the same plant, both flowers are on the same plant, it is still self-pollination. For it to be cross-pollination, it has to go from the anther of one flower onto the stigma of another flower on another tree of the same species. Let's go again. For it to be cross-pollination, it must go from the anther on one flower, the pollen grain that is, must leave from the anther of one flower and go onto and land onto the stigma of another flower on another tree of the same species. Got that? Good. Right, so let's go back. And this is the definition. With self-pollination, we have the transfer of pollen grains from the ant of a flower to the stigma of the same flower or a different flower on the same plant. On the same plant. This is self-pollination. Whereas with cross-pollination, we have the transfer of pollen grain from the ant of a flower on one plant to the stigma of a flower on another plant of the same species. Good. This is a definition, this, these definitions you must know. You must be able to differentiate and discriminate between self and cross-pollination. And I know you would have gotten it. Great. So let's move ahead. Look at this. Isn't this beautiful? Nature in its essence. The beauty of pollination. The bee would have landed on a flower and it was covered with pollen grains from that flower and now it has landed on another flower. Good? And what this is doing would be moving pollen grains around. Now, I don't know at this point whether this is self-pollination or it is cross-pollination because it could have gone from a flower on one plant and gone on to the stigma of another flower on the same plant, in which case that is self-pollination. Good? But what this does, it increases the chances of cross-pollination. And we look at some mechanisms that plants put in place to encourage cross-pollination. Let's look at that. Oh, before we go there, I just wanted to bring out this point. We saw the bees, and we know the bees play a very important role in ensuring pollination. But what is happening now? We have increasing use of pesticides. We are spraying. Everybody wants to spray. And don't just tell me, you know, um, it's... They are fogging or whatever. You are spraying at home. You are using your insecticides more than you have to. And we are getting rid of some of our important pollinators. Our bees, our wasp, our butterflies. These play an important role in pollination. Without them, we would not get the fruits and the other things that we would need. Mind you, 
vegetables, peppers, tomatoes, all of these things involve pollination. Good? So it is a very important process for our food supply. As a matter of fact, some countries, people will rear these pollinators simply for their food supply. Good? So let's look at some mechanisms, some features, some morphological features that a flower may have, a plant may have, to ensure cross-pollination. Because as I said earlier, cross-pollination is preferred for the eventual strength of the species. The more you have cross-pollination, the more you have mixing of genes, and so you get a superior product that can withstand environmental changes. Good? So how do some plants encourage cross-pollination? There are several things here, and it's written in red for you to see. This word here, diocese. I am sure we all know about papaw tree, papaw, P-A-W, P-A-W, papaw. And we would have seen some papaw trees with male flowers, and some again with female flowers. Let me have to try to improve my handwriting on this board, but you all will help me. Good, so just ignore the little arrows there. Good, let me go back. Good, so male, and female. Good? There are some pauper trees which have flowers with both male and female parts on them. Good? Those are called hermaphrodites. There are other pauper trees which the whole tree only has male flowers. Good? They only have stamen. And there are other pauper trees that only have female flowers. Good? And what that does, that when you have male and female on separate flowers, that is called diocese. Dio, you see the word dio too? You have the different parts on two different flowers, as opposed to monese. On monese, you have both male and female part on the same flower. Right? Some plants have that. And those are mechanisms, as I said, that some plants have to increase the chances of cross. Because if you have to leave the female plant, if you have to leave the male plant, sorry, and go over to the female plant, good? You are, the male plant has one genetic makeup and the female plant has another. And all of them will not go on the same female plant. So it increases the chances of the mixing of genes. Let me drop a point here. Those of you who have been watching your chenna tree, yeah, I know, that tree ain't had no use because it's not bearing. It has a use. It may be a male chenna tree. And if we don't have the males, then we cannot get the fruits. So you may feel it does not have a use. It does have a use. Good, same thing for the purple tree. We cannot cut down all the male purple trees and only a female. Then we would not get purple. Good, so we need to understand and appreciate that it, these are mechanisms that the plant has to increase the chances of the, the to increase the stock of the particular species. Then you have another thing here called dictogamy. Big word again, right? Dictogamy, you simply have some plants where their male part will develop before their female part. So what does that say? All right? When you have the anther, if you have the anther and the stigma, right, on the same plant, there are some plants that when the anther 
is ready and is open, their female part is not ready to, be, to receive, right? And the, vice versa, there are other plants where the female is ready before the male. So that means if the female is ready and the male is not ready, the only, how that, the only way in which that female plant will get its antenna is from another tree. And that would be a mechanism to encourage cross-pollination. You also have self-incompatibility. This is where the pollen grain, and I think I do have some slides here. This here is showing what we said about dioecious and monoecious plants. And we have the hermaphrodite here. So on this one, you're seeing dioecious has the, this, this here is a symbol for male. And this is the symbol, the international symbol for female. So both of them are in separate trees, right? That is a dioecious plant. The monoecious plant has some parts with male and some parts with female on the same plant. For example, corn. If you look at corn, have you observed corn? The corn, the top part of the corn with the flower, that's the male part. The female part, what we eventually eat, that is the female part. Both of them on the same plant. So that is an example of a monoecious plant. Good? And it is the pollen grains will flow from the anther at the top and flow down to the female part. Good? This here is an example of self-incompatibility. What does this mean? There are times when the pollen grain lands on the stigma, even though it is of the same species. If it is of the same plant, what will happen is that it will not germinate. The pollen, the pollen grain will not germinate, meaning the pollen grain will not start to grow down its tube. What normally happens when a pollen grain lands on a, another plant of the same species, it will normally form a germ tube which carries the nucleus down to meet the ovule inside of the ovary. But by this happening, there are some plants which avoid self-pollination. They are incompatible with the same pollen grain from the same, from the, from the same plant or the same flower. Good? You also have, this is called heterostyry. Heterostyly, H, let me get my color here. What color should I use? White. Hetero, heterostyly. And what is happening here, you may have differences in the location of the stigma to where the anther is. You notice this one, the stigma is lower, and in this one, the stigma is above. So in this one here, if a bee is coming here from another flower, it will brush on the stigma before it goes down here, right? So this arrangement, all of these are mechanisms that the plant has to encourage cross-pollination. How are we going, people? Good. So here we have the anther. And as you can see, this structure, we can see it actually is a four-wall structure. It has four chambers, right? And in each one of these chambers, what we have occurring there is the formation of the gamete. So if we look closer into one, and we're going to elaborate on this in a little bit, you can actually see different tissues. So you see in the epidermal tissue, that's the outside. We all know the epidermal tissue are those tissues that play a protective role, and they are very tough. Hence, they are, at, um, they are located on the outside, and so they can prevent drying out and so on. So you have the epidermis. You have a fibrous layer, which, which provides strength and, and maintains the, the integrity, the strength of this, this um, structure. You also have this layer here called the tapetum. The tapetum is really the layer 
that provides nourishment for the developing embryo. Okay? Sorry, for the developing ovule. And then we have the pollen grain. So we're going to elaborate on this in a little bit. What, I, what you're seeing here is actually an anther that has now opened out. Right? The anther will be closed during the formation of the pollen grains so that the development can take place. But once it is finished and the pollen grains are produced, you then have the this, this anther being broken, right? It's being broken at this point, and it will open out, and the entire structure will now have the pollen grains that are free for an insect to land on and pick up, or in the case of wind-pollinated flowers, for the wind to blow them out. <laughs>